sinners. And the cost of that sin is an eternal separation from God. The Bible terms that death. And what that means is that for anyone who dies in their sins, they will spend an eternity separated from God. And you need to be rescued from that. You need to be saved from that. So in this church service, you are going to have an opportunity to be rescued from that, to be saved from that. Because as Miss Belva just said, God is here. I believe He's here. And this morning, He's going to be speaking to you. He's going to make known to you that you are lost. Maybe you think you're saved. You went through some sort of motions, maybe as a child, went through some sort of church services. But God this morning, for some reason, is going to make clear to you that you are not saved and you need to be saved. And he's going to give you that opportunity to be saved. For some of you, this may be your first time in church. And it's not that you think you're saved, you're pretty sure you're lost. And God is meeting you right where you are this morning. And he wants you to be saved. And so this morning, I'm going to predominantly be talking to those of you who are saved. But I hope for any of you who are lost that you hear my heart towards you. And you hear God's heart towards you. That he desires that none of you would perish. But that all of you would come to repentance. Now, as I shared just a moment ago, last Sunday, I brought a message to you that was intended to cause you to evaluate your faithfulness to the Great Commission. Uh, In simple, the Great Commission, uh, for those of you who are lost, the Great Commission is Jesus' instruction to the church not to keep Jesus to ourselves, but to take the good news of Jesus Christ out into a lost world. And so he commissioned the church, he commissioned the believers, not only of his day, but of today as well, to go and to carry the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ to a lost world. And so that commission was given 2,000 years ago. And, and what I brought to us last week were these five questions for us to evaluate how well are we doing, you Christian, me Christian, how well are we doing at fulfilling, at living out the Great Commission? And if you weren't set on fire Sunday night, then your wood's wet. All right? You had some preaching last Sunday night that that was right on target. But these were the five questions just to remind you. Are you where God has directed you? Will you worship Him or will you doubt Him? Are you willing to submit to His authority to join in the work that He is doing? Will you believe that you can... Live out the Great Commission. And do you truly believe that Jesus Himself is with you in fulfilling and living out the Great Commission? Well, this morning, as I stated earlier, we're going to embark on four messages. This one and three more to follow. And these messages are intended to deal with some practical steps that you and I can take in fulfilling the Great Commission. At the end of this message, I'm going to bring to you a couple of practical steps that I want you as members of this church to begin to take. I'm going to ask of your teachers some things. If they teach you on Sunday morning in Sunday school, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I'm going to ask of them to make a commitment that I will be making to you today. And so there are going to be some practical things at the end that I hope you will embrace. I truly believe that every Christian can live out the Great Commission. I believe that the early church that we see in the New Testament sets for us 
some very basic, some very simple insights of steps that we can take in order to live out the Great Commission. And I believe that God is about to do an incredible work in the life of this church. On Wednesday, I was in a, in a setting uh, in this community, and a man comes up to me. I know he's a strong believer. I know he's a faithful prayer warrior. I know the church that he goes to. And he came up to me at, in, in passing, and I just greeted him, said, How are you doing? And some of those types of things. And he said, I want you to know something. God has been burdening my heart for your church. And I believe that God is about to do a great work in your church. He said, as I look at this community and I see more and more people moving into this community, as I see Temple moving into this community, all the houses that are being built, all the children that are coming into these schools, I believe that God is going to do a great work in the life of your church. And I said, well, let me just share with you something. I said, last Sunday, I put before the church and I said, this is the vision that we have been praying towards. I have called up a team and said, y'all pray with me, y'all work with me, because I believe God wants us to be a disciple-making church, that we are continually, that we are intentionally making disciples. Every Christian, and I just kind of put that before him and said, this is what we're looking at doing. And I said, pray for me. And he said, I want you to know this. He said, I believe that God is already preparing your church for this great work that He's going to do. And I believe it. I believe you and I should expect this morning for God to move. I believe you and I should be expecting that God is going to take you and meet you right here and He's going to take you on that next step. The next step in faithfulness to the Great Commission. And this morning, my desire is to challenge you related to prayer and the Great Commission. So in your Bibles, if you would look with me briefly at Acts chapter 4. I don't know why I said briefly. It's not going to be brief. Um, I guess it's just one verse, so the the verse is going to be brief. But I probably shouldn't have said that. Acts 4 verse 31. Now listen to this. And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning, that is our desire. It is our desire that we would approach you in prayer. That we would gather together in prayer. That, God, we would follow the example that is being set for us of the New Testament church, gathering together in prayer. And that, God, you would move in a powerful way. God, you would move in such a way that, Lord, we would be filled with your Holy Spirit and we would proclaim your word with boldness. And so, God, this morning, I invite you, I ask you, Lord, To bring us, God, to where you are. God, bring us to that place of faithfulness that you are leading us to. Thank you, God, for what you are doing in our midst. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to give you the first thing. Begin with purposeful prayer. Begin with purposeful prayer. I said just a moment ago, I expect God to move. I expect God to move you. And I want you to hear this. This is my desire is for God, for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the Holy Spirit of God to move us forward as a church to intentionally and continually make disciples. But I don't want it to be dependent on me. I don't want it to be dependent on this disciple-making team. I want us to be dependent on God. I want our dependency to be on God. And this morning, I declare to you, if you will begin, if you will begin with purposeful prayer, then you will begin to live out the Great Commission. That's a promise to you. You begin with purposeful prayer and you will begin to live out the Great Commission. You see, God 
will transform your heart to live out the Great Commission if you will be purposeful in prayer. You can expect God to move you to live out that Great Commission if you will be purposeful in your prayer. Now, I want to just take you through the book of Acts for just a moment up to this point. In Acts chapter 1, we see that Jesus has gathered together with his disciples and he tells them that he wants them to go to Jerusalem and stay there until he sends the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus ascends into heaven before them and they look at him and they see him ascending into heaven and they go back to Jerusalem. And what we read in Acts 1.14 is that in the upper room with one accord they devoted themselves to prayer. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit moves upon them and Peter in the faithfulness through the power of the Holy Spirit begins to proclaim the Word of God and people of all sorts of different languages are hearing this preaching and they're understanding it in their own language and many people are coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And Acts 2.42 says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayer. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are headed to the temple at the time of prayer. And as they are going to the temple at the time of prayer, there's this lame man, this paralyzed man, this beggar, and he calls out to them. And Peter and John heal this man in the power of Jesus' name. In this day in which they are going for a time of prayer, they do a miraculous work because of the hand of Almighty God is upon them. And as we come to Acts chapter 4, this, this passage that we just came to, Peter and John, because of the miraculous work that is happening, because of the thousands of people who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, many of them Jews turning away from their religious traditions, turning away from their legalisms, and turning to true faith in Jesus Christ. Well, this is stirring up some of those religious elites. It's stirring up those preachers. It's stirring up all of those fuddy-duddies. And they arrest them. Now listen to what verse 2 of chapter 4 says, greatly annoyed. In other words, Peter and John were annoying these guys. They were annoying The religious leaders. So they put them in jail. They arrest them. They tell them, you can't be teaching anymore in this Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. In verse 4 it says, But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Listen, this is what is taking place in the church. Within a matter of just a few weeks of their faithfulness to the Great Commission, you are seeing thousands of people who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Now listen at what verse 7 says of these religious leaders. These religious leaders say this, By what power? Or by what name did you do this? In other words, the healing of this man from his paralysis. By what power or by what name did you do this? Boy, that's just saying sick him, right? So listen at what he says in verse 10. Let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Now they asked and they told, right? Where is this power coming from? They said this power is coming from Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is not my work. This is the work of God being done in my life. It's being done through us. Now look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness, I'd say that's bold. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John in verse 13, they perceived that they were uneducated common men. They were uneducated, common men. They saw boldness in them. But they didn't have all the seminary training. They didn't have all of this. They were just common men. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were just everyday, ordinary people. But listen at what it says. They were astonished that they were just uneducated. But listen, the end of verse 13. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus.
It doesn't require us going to seminary to fulfill the Great Commission. It requires that we're with Jesus. That we are with Jesus. They were astonished by the boldness of these common, uneducated men. And all they could say is these men have been with Jesus. And so they threatened them. Don't you say anything again about the name of Jesus. Now listen to verse 19. But Peter and John answered this, whether it's, in, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak what we have heard. Now, here in the New Testament church, They have been charged with the Great Commission. They have been charged with the Great Commission. They have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And they are living out the Great Commission. But they're facing much opposition now. They are facing much opposition now. So what do they do? What do they do? Look at verse 24 and we'll see what they did. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You know, there's an interesting little thing about verse 21 here. As they threatened them not to speak any more of the name of Jesus, the end of verse 21 says this. They were, basically, they were afraid. There was no way for them to punish Peter and John. Listen, because of the people, for all were praising God. For all were praising God for what had happened. Listen, church. The verse that we just read, verse 31, begins this way. And when they had prayed. And when they had prayed. Why is it that God moved in such a powerful way in the New Testament church? Why did God save so many people? Acts 2.31 says that 3,000 souls were added that day. Acts 2.47 said that the Lord added to their number daily, not Sundays, but daily, those who were being saved. Acts 4.4, many who heard the word of God believed and the number of men came to about 5,000. Why did they see God saving so many? I believe the answer is first this, personal prayer. Personal, and let me add to that, Personal, purposeful prayer. The disciples, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, there's something different about you. And in Luke 11, 1, they say, Jesus, teach us to pray as you pray. You see, they observed Jesus and they observed that there was something different about how he prayed. He did not go through the legalistic motions of prayer. It wasn't that he was praying because he was supposed to. It wasn't that he was praying because it was the hour to pray. But there was something personal about his prayers. There was something personal about his communication with God, about his relationship with God. There was something purposeful about why he was praying. He was not praying just for the sake of praying, but there was something personal, something purposeful about his prayers. And Jesus, when he comes to these disciples and they say to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. He gives them that model prayer, that Lord's prayer that many of you have memorized. And he gives them this prayer and he says, this is how you can pray. But he goes further than that. And he gives them two basic illustrations. One is a neighbor who who goes to his neighbor and he says, look, man, I need some bread. I've got some people who've come to my house. And there's a persistence with this neighbor getting bread from his neighbor. He gives another story of a boy who is asking of his father of some good food. And he says, what father would take that son who asked for good food and then give him a serpent or a scorpion? 
scorpion or stones, rocks, whatever. He says that doesn't make sense. And what Jesus is teaching his disciples is something that you and I must understand. The question really comes is, will you personally pray? Jesus said, look, this is how you pray. You pray to the Father with purpose. You pray to the Father that which is good and that which is pleasing to Him. And when you pray to Him, purposefully ask Him for those things that are pleasing, those things that are honorable, and persist in it. That neighbor saying, I'm not leaving until you get up out of the bed and you give me some bread. There was a persistence with that neighbor that Jesus was speaking of in Luke chapter 11. And you and I must have that persistence and you and I will see God deliver. But will you personally pray? Will you pray with a purpose? Let me ask you this. Would it please and honor God for a lost person to be saved? Would it please and honor God for a lost person to be saved? Is that God's will? Is that God's purpose? Is that God's desire? Is that God's heart for lost people to be saved? We all seem to agree on this, don't we? So do you believe that you would be praying in His will and in His name when you're praying for lost people? You understand that when you are purposefully praying for lost people, you are praying in accordance with His will. You are praying in accordance with His name. You are being purposeful in that. Now listen to this. Turn for just a moment to Romans chapter 10. And I want you to hear the the heart cry here of Paul. In Romans chapter 10, basically 9, 10, and 11 Uh, of Romans focuses on, on Paul's heart towards the Jews. Paul predominantly is a missionary to the Gentiles, but he has a heart for the Jews. And I want you to hear his prayer. Hear what Paul says in Romans 10, 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. You see, we have an example right here in our scriptures. You and I have an example that the word of God, that Paul, the great missionary, that he prayed for the salvation of lost people. And to take it just a step further, look at Romans chapter 9 and hear his heart in this dialogue that begins in chapter 9 and goes through to chapter 11. In chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, listen to what Paul says. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself be accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul says there is great sorrow, there is great anguish in my heart for the Jews. What is Paul's prayer for the Jews? His prayers for their salvation. And he says there's sorrow in my heart, there's anguish in my heart. There was a deep concern in his heart for the lostness of Israel. Do we have that loss, that, that anguish? Do we have that sorrow in our hearts for that son who is lost, for that loved one who is lost, for that friend who is lost? Do we have that? I dare say we don't have that same of sorrow that Paul says. Paul says, look, God, if all of Israel could be cursed, but that would mean I would lose my salvation. I'm willing to lose my salvation for them to be saved. I'm not going to say that. I know it can't happen. It can't happen for us to lose our salvation. But that's Paul's cry there. He says, I am praying. There's a purposefulness in his prayer for lost people to be saved, specifically for his own people, the Jews. There was that longing that came from God. And if you were one to say to me, Brent, I'm not much on witnessing, then I'm going to say this to you. Fine, I'll accept that. I accept you saying to me, Brent, I'm I'm not much on witnessing to lost people. I say to you, fine, I'm not asking you to begin there. I'm asking you to begin with purposeful prayer. I'm asking you to begin by praying purposefully for lost people to be saved. Now, here's what I believe is going to happen. When you commit to praying for lost people to be saved, God's going to change your heart. This preacher's not changing your heart. 
The disciple-making advisory team's not going to change your heart. God's going to change your heart. It's not going to be dependent on me. It's not going to be dependent on them. It's going to be dependent on God. You begin daily praying for those lost people to be saved, then what God is going to do is He is going to change that heart that says, I don't think I can witness to somebody. You see, we have met for months now praying and in Sunday afternoons just spending time discussing where do we go in leading this church and where we believe that God is leading us. And this is, this is, is exactly where I believe God is going to take us if we will allow him. I believe that as you begin with purposeful prayer for lost people, I believe that we as a church will be coming alongside of you and we will be equipping you and we will be enabling you. And there is going to be in some kind of an artificial type way, in other words, we're going to orchestrate that for six months, basically six months, from June through November, and let the Lord extend that a little bit further. But we're going to be purposeful in what we are doing to help you to be more intentional about your disciple making. And here's what I believe. I don't believe that after this six months that we're going to have those classes anymore. I don't believe that we're going to have a new believers class in this church. I don't think it's going to happen. I believe what's going to happen in this church is this church, there are going to be saints in this church. That is you, common, ordinary men and women who've been with Jesus. You're the saints. And you're going to be praying for lost people. And God's going to so burden your heart for those lost people that when that opportunity comes, you're going to share your faith in Jesus Christ with them. You're going to say, well, I don't know how to share my faith. We're going to teach you. You're going to share your testimony with them. Well, I don't know how to share my testimony. We're going to teach you. We're going to practice this. We're going to know how to share our faith with them. And listen, you're not going to be coming to me. You're going to be saying, I want to share it. It's my responsibility to share with that lost person. And what's going to happen is there's going to be this burden in your heart that God gives you. All the praise goes to God, not the preacher, not any team. But all the praise goes to God because God is going to burden your heart through prayer. Through prayer, your heart is going to be burdened and you're going to share your faith in Christ. It might take years, and that's okay. We're not putting any timetable on anything, but you're going to pray for that person. You're going to pray for that person. And it might be three months, it might be eight months, it might be two years down the road that you're going to have that opportunity in which you purposely share your faith in Jesus Christ. That person comes to faith in Jesus Christ and you're going to say, Preacher, I want to mentor this person. That class that we did for those days, I want to take that notebook that I have and I want to go through that with me. Will you give me some of them blank pages so that I can give it to them and week by week by week I can take them through the basics of their faith and I can help mentor them and grow them. I don't want to wait on you as a church to get something together. I want to do it now. I believe that's what God's going to do. Listen, there is great discipleship that's taking place in our Sunday school classes. You need to be in Sunday school. There's great discipleship that's taking place on Sunday nights. There's great discipleship that is taking place on Wednesday nights. And all of that is good. All of that is right. All of that is what we should be doing. We should be faithfully teaching the Word of God here in church. But that doesn't mean that there can't be a greater work that happens in discipleship. And that is that one-on-one personal relationship with that person you lead to faith in Jesus Christ. And I believe the reason that God moved in such a powerful way was the purposeful prayers that people were personally praying to God for lost people to be saved. They prayed, and listen to this. This is the second reason I believe that God moved in such a powerful way. They came together as a church to pray. They came together as a church to pray. So here's my plea to us. Will we pray as a family? Will we as a church pray as a family? The place in which they were gathered together 
was shaking. I want to be honest with you. That air conditioner is about to get me shaking up here. But uh, it, it got fixed. If y'all were here last week, it was a little warm in here. It got fixed, and that thing's blowing right now. Um, I don't normally get cool up here. I am kind of sweating a little bit, but I guarantee you it's, it's cool right up here. This platform's normally a little bit hotter. Um, where was I going? I don't know where I was going. Shaking. There you go. I literally prayed this morning. I said, Lord, if it is your will, shake this place. If it is your will, shake this place. Make them chandeliers shake. Let a little bit of that, that paint come chipping off and falling off on us. God, shake this place. Move this place. Move us. In verse 24, it says, they lifted their voices together to God. There was a togetherness of these disciples. In the newsletter, uh, you, if you read that thing, uh, I wrote this, and Katie questioned me, exactly what do you mean by it? I heard a preacher once say this, that we spend far too much time praying the saints out of heaven than we do the sinners out of hell. So let's explain that just a little bit, okay? You and I don't have the ability to pray anybody out of hell Okay, we don't have the ability to pray anybody out of heaven. If they've died, they're in that destination, okay? There's no purgatory, there's no moving them from one spot to another, anything else like that, okay? When you die, your destination is either the lake of fire or heaven. So we don't pray them out of those places, okay? So let's just clear up if that might be any confusion. But here's what the preacher was saying. Now think about this for just a minute, and I guess I'd better say this first, okay? I don't have any problem with us praying for sick people in our church, okay? We need to pray for sick people in our church. But I want you to think for just a moment. Think of prayer boards in the Sunday school rooms. Think of the times that we come together for prayer and we take those prayer requests. What are the majority of those prayer requests? It's a sick saint, right? We spend so much time praying in comparison for a saint to get over their sickness, do you understand the sickness of a lost person? Do you understand the eternal ramification consequences of a lost person? My son was sick on Wednesday, and I took him to the urgent care, late time care, whatever, at the new children's hospital thing over there. Okay? He was sick. But a little medicine, a little bit of time, and he's all good. But a lost person, They need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are not concerned enough with their lostness to pray for them to be delivered out of the bondage of sin that they are in. You know, maybe we don't really believe that there's a heaven or hell. Maybe we are are really just atheists who are practicing a Christian religion. Why are we not spending more time purposely praying as a church for lost people to be saved? When we come together in our classes Sundays and Wednesdays, let's spend more meaningful time praying for the lost. Back in September of 2011, I was asked to join with a group of eight other pastors for a time, a a day of prayer. And a part of that time was to pray, and a part of that time was to pray and to discuss issues that are related to prayer and revival. And in this meeting, one of the pastors that was there, his name was Dr. Charles Stewart. And Dr. Stewart is the pastor of Cana Baptist Church in Burleson, Texas, just out of the Dallas-Fort Worth, or I guess it's still kind of in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but basically in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The church is about twice the size of this church in their average attendance. But Pastor Charles Stewart shared with us what God had been doing, and a part of his invitation to go to this prayer meeting that we had was because of the evidence of what was seen of what God was doing in his church. In February of 2011, he preached an evangelistic series called Shattering the Darkness. So in February, he preaches this message, evangelistic message, Great Commission focused evangelistic message. And he asked this of his church. He asked them this. Do you believe that it would honor the Lord for us to ask him to allow someone in our church to lead one soul to the Lord this week? 
Would it honor the Lord if one person in this church was able to lead one soul to Christ? And he said, you know, you can tell when the church is for Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the Lord be pleased with that. The Lord would be honored with that if this week one soul would come to faith in Jesus Christ. And he said, well, we're going to stop right here. And that's what we're going to pray to God. And these are the words that he prayed. Father, if it would please and honor you, would you allow someone in our church family to have the joy and privilege this week to lead one soul to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Within just a couple of days, a church member called him and said, Pastor Charles, I just had the privilege of leading someone to faith in Jesus Christ. And so he took the name of that person who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. And the next Sunday morning, in the midst, in the beginning of this series of Shattering the Darkness, he took a candle and he placed a candle down on this communion table and he lit it. And when it came to the time of prayer, he shared with the church, not the name of the individual who shared Christ with them, but the individual first name who came to faith in Jesus Christ. And he said, I lit this candle this morning because John or whatever his name was, came to faith in Jesus Christ this week because one of our church members shared their faith with them. He said the church was fired up. And when we were meeting, this is September, basically six months later, he said it has almost never been a Sunday since that we've not had at least one candle lit because of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Two years later, in November, this little article was in our state paper. And I know all of you can't see it, but that's, his, that's who he is. That's Charles Stewart right there. The article was about this. And two years later, over 600 people, over 600 people came to faith. In Jesus Christ. Where did it begin? You're right. It began with one person. But I'm going to stick to my second point here. They were praying as a family. Every Sunday. Since that Sunday. In February. They have prayed. Lord. If it would please you. And honor you. Give someone the joy and the privilege of leading a soul to faith in Jesus Christ. So let me get very practical with us as a church here. Prayer will be foundational. Not an afterthought. Prayer will be foundational for us living out the Great Commission. And it will be foundational because in Acts 4.21 it says that all the people were praising God. That's what I desire. I desire that people in this community would praise not First Baptist Church of Academy, Not Brent the preacher, not the advisory team that he put together at the first of the year, but this community would be praising God because they are seeing God move in a powerful way in the life of this church, into this community, into the uttermost parts of the earth. But prayer will be our starting point. So here's something tangible for you. I'm asking you to purposefully pray. I'm asking each and every one of you as Christians to purposefully pray. And here's how. There's a little card right here. It has five blanks on it. And those five blanks are for five lost people. So I don't want to offend somebody. What if somebody sees my card? 
Run them, be offended, and go to heaven or go to hell feeling good with you. All right? Let's just get honest about it. I want to ask you, okay, you can do this as a family. Back prior to the start of some of this stuff that God was doing in my heart and bringing the team together and all of that, that was one of the things that God burdened me to do. In my devotional Bible that I do my quiet times, there's an index card in there. And that index card has a number of names on it. And I can tell you that the names of some of those there, God has given me some incredible opportunities to share my faith with them. One of them happened right out on the ball field. For some reason, after a couple months of praying, God decided to put his kid on Blake's team. And so we met out there at the ball field and began to talk. And I shared my testimony with him, and he shared his testimony with me. He's lost. He's left his family now. And I may never have another opportunity to share with him. But his family's lost. And they're our neighbors. And we're going to pray for them. And we're going to seek to see the day that they come to faith in Jesus Christ. My son will have an opportunity to be a part of that. So as a family, you can do this as an individual family. You can have five names on your own. If you want to, that's fine. But you can also just have five names as a family. But I'm asking every single family in this church to have at least, at least five names that you're going to pray for daily. You're going to pray for the salvation of of these lost people daily. That's all I'm asking of you in this first step. Come back next week. i got more for you. But this is your first step, all right? Pray daily for five lost people. I believe you're going to be amazed to see what God ends up doing. I have enjoyed sharing with the disciple-making team. Look, this is what God gave me the opportunity to do with these that I prayed for. I had challenged them. I said, I want you to write down five names for you to begin praying for them. Listen, I read all five names this morning of somebody else's card. And this is going to be my commitment that I make to you. I ask, well, first, let me go back to you for a minute before I get on me. For you, which I'm doing it too, I want to ask you to pray this for those lost people. I want to ask you to pray for them to hear the gospel. For them to be saved. But I want to ask you to say this. Lord, if it is me to share with them, I volunteer. Can you say that to God? Will you say that to God? Now, let me give you a little clarification here. Don't put Vladimir Putin on here. All right. The dude needs to be saved, okay? And, and, and we need to pray for him to be saved. You're not going to go talk to him, okay? I don't, I don't think any of you are going to go and talk to him. So I want names on here of people six months from now, a year from now. You are going to be willing to share your faith in Jesus Christ with them. You'll have that opportunity. You'll make that opportunity. You'll do your best to make that opportunity. So that's what I ask of you. Five names. People that you have the opportunity with. People that you will have the opportunity with. A lost child, a lost friend, a lost neighbor, whoever that might be. So here's what I'm going to commit to you. I commit to you to the best of my ability. Every Sunday I'm going to ask one of you for a card. Isn't that fun? All of us just went, I'm going to come up to you at random. And I'm going to say, can I see your card for just a moment? I'm going to take it up in the pulpit. I'm not going to tell you who it is. You don't know whose card this is. And I didn't read their last names. But every Sunday morning from this pulpit, I will pray for five people that you are concerned about. You say to me, preacher, I didn't have my, you know, because I don't always wear, you know, thing with a pocket here. I said, preacher, I forgot to put that in my wallet today. No problem. Okay? No guilt. No, no nothing. Okay? No problem. I'm going to find somebody else. I might ask you next week. But 
But I'm going to ask you because I want this church to join in with you in praying for the lost people that your heart is burdened for. In other words, there's going to be hundreds of people who are praying for the name of Neil. They don't know who Neil is, but this friend knows who Neil is, and this friend knows that Sunday morning over a hundred people joined the pastor in praying for Neil. And this is our starting point. I ask our teachers, teachers in your classes, in your Sunday school classes, ask them, do you, who can we pray for that's lost? Still pray for sick people, okay? I'm not telling you not to be praying for sick people. But pray for lost people. Be intentional, purposeful about that. You believe God answers prayers? So what do you think He's going to do? When we, the church, begin purposefully, intentionally, continually praying for lost people. He's going to be glorified. He's going to be honored. And we will get the privilege of being a part of seeing God move to save lost people. Isn't that what the Great Commission is all about? That you and I are doing our part in what He has called us to do. Let's take this first example from the New Testament church. And let's begin with prayer. During this invitation time, come down and grab a card. So, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready to make that commitment today. Okay, they're going to be down here. Come next week. Come in a couple of weeks. But will you purposefully move with God? Now I address those of you who might be lost earlier in the service. I want you to know this. God loves you. And it is my desire somebody in this church that this whole church will have the opportunity to pray for you to surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and maybe this morning is the morning for you maybe that friend has already been praying for you and the preacher didn't ask him to and this morning you know you need to come down You need to say, Preacher, I want to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. This morning, how do you need to respond, church? This morning, if you're lost and you know that Jesus died and rose to life to save you, will you come today and make that public? Bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. As we come to the end of this service, 